for everybody to join in you know uh, because there are people registered i've already started streaming now so you have yes okay okay one more moment So, Rupesh Swati, I'll uh, f- first, as soon as Lata Ji finishes her introduction, I'll say a couple of words about Shishu Bharti and then I'll hand it over to Rupesh. Okay. And uh, Swati, you're going to share, right? Uh, you're going to share your screen? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And I think two things we'll have to do is stop annotation. Yes, mm-hmm. I think that's it. <laughs> <that's- laughs> okay, we are live right now. Um, Lata, you can go ahead. Yes. As soon as Lata Ji finishes her introduction, I'll say a couple of words about Shishu Bharti and then I'll hand it I think people need to mute their... Uh, I think they're getting some feedback. Can we get that? I think two things we'll have to do is stop annotation. I think good morning, everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us this morning uh, on this uh, auspicious day that we are celebrating uh, uh, India's uh, Republic uh, Day uh, on uh, January 26th. And we had, we had a learning series uh, kickoff in August. And we are continuing that trend to uh, talk about India's Republic Day. So we have wonderful teachers from Shishu Bharti that are going to be participating. And uh, my name is Lata Rao from, I'm the secretary of IAGB. We are joined by uh, our president here, Sanjay Gowda, as well as uh, Sushil, uh, one of our directors, who's going to be handling the live streaming. So uh, we are, I'm going to introduce the teachers to you today. Um, the wonderful teachers of Shishu Bharti. Uh, Sanjay Rao, who is the Vice President for Culture at Shishu Bharti Nashua. He also teaches uh, culture to eighth grade students currently. And he has been working with Shishu Bharti for the past 14 years. So we uh, say a hi, a big hi to everyone. <laughs> Sanjay, glad to have you. Yeah. And Hello, then we have Rupesh Mathur, who has been uh, teaching uh, culture at uh, eight at Shishu Bharti, Nashua, for the past five years. He's a mechanical engineer and is passionate about learning and teaching history, culture, and philosophy, which you'll see in abundance today when he's teaching. <laughs> then we have our wonderful, beautiful Swati Lekha. Swati, Swati Leka Mehti. She has been teaching Indian history and geography to middle school children at Shishu Bharti, uh, Lexington for the past uh, five years, sorry, six years. She is an analytics professional and loves to read and travel while trying out different cuisines. So again, excited to have you on board too, Swati. And uh, so today's session will cover uh, the period of Indian history, starting with the time where governance of India became a red hot topic, um, up to the time when India gained independence. We will also, uh, they will also talk about the Constituent Assembly, which gave the massive responsibility to the framing of the Constitution of India. And session two, which is tomorrow at six o'clock, uh, six p.m., um, we will continue with the, some of the main role players in the framing of the constitution and go into the details of how the constitution of India and how it came, to, uh, how it came together essentially. So, we're very excited to be presenting this uh, two-part series, and I know you all will be uh, in a dreary day like this. Get your hot cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa, whatever it is, and sit back and relax and and enjoy this wonderful presentation. Over to you, uh, Swati. I see you're going to be kicking off the, the presentation. Swati, you're on mute. Uh, so, yeah, as, uh, Swati gets ready to share the screen. Uh, I'll just okay. like to say a couple Go of words here uh, on behalf of Shishubharti. I think uh, Shishubharti has been around here in the New England region for uh, more than 35 years now. We're getting close to 40 years. Uh, currently, we have three branches with about 900 students. So, it's a, it's a fairly big operation and uh, com- run completely by volunteers. So we're extremely proud of being part of a, of a great school like that, which teaches Indian language and culture uh, and you know tries to keep uh, some of that awareness going as our second and third generation uh, Indians are born and assimilated into the uh, United States, uh, you know, uh, m- melting part of culture. So we hope to keep some of the ideology, the thoughts and and knowledge alive by means of Shishu Bharti and uh, extremely grateful to IAGB also to for giving us this opportunity, uh, you know, exposing us to the much wider audience uh, 
and giving us a chance to share our uh, you know findings knowledge uh, with you all so uh, that said i'm going to give it over to rupesh uh, who's going to start kick off the series today uh, I, thank you sanjay uh, thank you lata ji and thank you swati um, so uh, <clears throat> In today's session, we'll uh, start with a little bit of a dive into Indian history, uh, especially the period of British rule, and uh, first starting with some definitions. So, uh, as you know, we celebrate Republic Day, right? And then August fifteenth is uh, Independence Day, and January twenty-sixth is Republic Day. Uh, that's how we celebrate it. So, the question is: uh, If you look at Indian history uh, for a long period of time, we were ruled by empires, and then finally by the British Empire. We're part of the British Empire. So. Uh, what is a republic and why did we choose that form of government right so we have to look at that so let's start with some basic definitions what is republic so the word republic comes from the latin for res publica meaning residing with the people and it has two definitions it's a government that has a chief of state who is not a monarch he's selected by the citizens and in modern times he's a president or some other titular head and then the other thing is that a government in which the supreme power resides in a body of citizens Uh, entitled to vote and is uh, and that power is exercised by elected officers whom the citizens vote for and any representatives who are responsible to them and governing according to law right so so basically the two main features of a republic is that we don't have hereditary uh, heads of states uh, they are mostly selected from among the people and then you have a body of citizens among the population who are entitled to vote and then they uh, elect officers and representatives who then exercise power over the uh, country over the country or the the, the region so If you look at the history of republics, the first republic in the world was actually in India. It was the state of Vaishali in Bihar, uh, which was from about sixth to seventh century BCE or earlier. So Vaishali is most famous as the birthplace of Mahavira, right? And as the last and the place where the Buddha actually breathed his last. So Vaishali is a important place in Indian history. And um, so, but one of the characteristics of Vaishali was that it had several clans and the clans collaborated to rule the place and they would essentially elect or nominate people from among themselves who would rule the the area uh, uh, rule the kingdom it is not a kingdom actually because there's no king but it was uh, but it's basically the country right and then uh, on on the western side um, athenian democracy was the first republic on the western side so uh, around the aegean sea the ionian civilization in the 6th century bc uh, in athens especially evolved a, a republic a democratic republic which was bicameral so uh, we hear about lok sabha and rajya sabha legislative assemblies and uh, and so on so Uh, the athenian democracy actually had those features so it had the ecclesia which is the assembly and the boule which is the legislative council and uh, here uh, you know voting was limited to all adult free male so women were not allowed to vote and uh, they had fair number of slaves whom they had got by conquest uh, because they used to wage wars against their neighbors and they would capture people and those were the slaves and slaves were not allowed to vote only uh, adults were allowed to vote and um, essentially so the athenian democracy uh, in western civilization is considered the first republic but older than that by a little bit is vaishali in india uh, next slide please so the model for most modern democratic republics which is what we live with, with today is the roman republic and the roman republic was in existence for almost 500 years uh, about a century after the athenian republic and it had many of the features that we are familiar with so it had elected leadership so it had chief magistrates or consuls and magistrates and who were elected on an annual basis and then they had a legislature with the upper house and lower house uh, which was elected every 18 months so the upper house was uh, the roman senate or senatus so which is where we get our senate in the united states um and senex refers to the elders and basically these were the elite the were these were the the plutocrats of the society uh, and what would happen is that the eldest of the family uh, would be elected right or would be made a senator so julius caesar was a senator for example and it has uh, it had a lot of power it was it had advisory relationship with the uh, magistrates and consuls and it was also a legislative body it had it followed a body of law and then it voted on new laws and decrees 
Then they had the lower house because Rome had uh, the ordinary people who were called the plebs. So uh, the plebs elected their own representatives who were called the tribunes and they collectively formed the tribunate. And uh, the number of tribunes varied over history. Uh, first it was 10 people, then it became 50 people and then it came back down. Uh, so it varied, but uh, generally speaking, they had um, they basically ordinary people, the plebeians uh, elected, elected tribunes. And then the military also had representatives. So they had military tribunes and they can, uh, and they had the ability to propose laws and elect magistrates, but they had much less power than the Senate. And lastly, uh, the Roman Republic had a constitution, which we'll come to in a little bit, which is basically guidelines and principles for governing. And they actually pioneered things like checks and balances, having multiple branches of government that kept each other in check so that power is not concentrated in one branch. Uh, they had the concept of term limits, which we hear about impeachments, which are in the news, uh, quorum, veto, elections, all those things uh, they, they basically uh, uh, had uh, used. Uh, lastly, uh, we come to constitution. So one of the features of uh, republics is that it has a constitution. So why do you need a constitution? It's because you don't have hereditary uh, inheritance of leadership. So you have new people who come and uh, then they get voted out and then other people who come after that. So when you have uh, constant turnover, you need principles to govern by, to give guidance to all the people who are coming. And uh, so a constitution is nothing but governing fundamentalist principles for a state or organization. And uh, these are foundational principles or laws that the society has agreed on. They're typically based on precedents which are developed over long periods of time, typically centuries and ideas that have come up over centuries that they value. And, um, and then it, it, is, it becomes codified into the constitution. And it's a living document. It, uh, it can be amended and uh, it has a specific procedure for amendment. So uh, constitutions have a long history, in fact, longer, as long as human civilization. So at the very top, you see the code of Hammurabi in the, from uh, Sumerian or Mesopotamia, uh, which is the first written constitution. So this is on carved on stone. So and they've recovered the stone. Then you have the American constitution, which we are familiar with, which was uh, written primarily by Thomas Jefferson, right? The sage of uh, Monticello. And then you have the Indian constitution, which we'll learn about um, in these classes, uh, which was primarily written by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who's considered the father of the Indian constitution. And uh, so, uh, um, so I think that uh, 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 one of the things that you see is that the modern constitutions are liberal constitutions. So we'll, uh, they're based on liberal ideas of government. All right, now let's go to the, um, uh, the, the Indian history. So now that we've got the, through the definitions, Indian history uh, in, in India, of the British Empire. So the British Empire in India, you know, as many of you know, started with the East India Company. And then in 1857, there was a huge revolt, which was called the Sepoy Mutiny. And then after that revolt, uh, India became part of the British Empire and ruled directly by the British Crown. And the British actually wanted to remake India in, in their mold, which is uh, English speaking liberal uh, parliamentary democracy, uh, but they didn't want to give up control, right? So they educated a small number of Indians to who could run the country. And many of those Indians got exposure to the new ideas, uh, liberal democracy ideas, and they said, hey, we can form a party. So they formed a party called the INC, Indian National Congress, which is now in the form of the Congress that we have. And the Indian National Congress was more of a debating club for a long time. Uh, it it said some not so good things about the English uh, rule, British rule, uh, until the rise of Gandhi. And then and when Gandhiji came up, uh, he took the uh, whole uh, dialogue with the British, which they, which they were having, which was both, both an anti and pro-British, into mass, uh, uh, mass agitations. So in 1921, we had the civil disobedience uh, right movement. In 1928, um, there was the Simon Commission and Nehru report, which will come out, uh, which kind of was a, uh, basically the British saying, okay, these guys are uh, actually wanting something more. So let's try to give them something more. And then the uh, Indians who by then had gotten educated also wrote their own report, which is called the Nehru report, which on their, on their picture of how India should be governed. In 1930, uh, you had the civil disobedience movement, the, uh, the, uh, the, the salt march, as many of you know. But along with that, there was the Indian Declaration of Independence, which is on Jan 26. That's, and that's where the date Jan 26 has come from. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And, in, and then what happened is that there was a period in which the Congress was in government. And then that ended with the Quit India Movement in 1942. And the Quit India Movement uh, is when most of the freedom fighters were sent to jail. 
and, uh, and they were released only after two to three years, at which point, uh, you know, the uh, freedom was on the horizon. So Indian freedom was on the horizon. And finally, we attained freedom on 1947, on August 15th. We'll talk about when that happened. And uh, the, the, the freedom part of it uh, happened very quickly. And so the Indians were not prepared. So what they did is they created a constituent assembly and their constituent assembly came up with the constitution of, of India. And then that constitution, when it was adopted in 1950, became the foundation of the modern Indian Republic that we are familiar with. Okay, so that's the basic view. So uh, let's talk about the British Raj and the legislative response. So basically the British had a problem because uh, they were a very small country. They were only about 30 million people uh, when they took over India and they were ruling an extremely large, extremely diverse population, which was fairly chaotic, right? So, you know, we are, as those who first have been to India or from India, or other, it's chaotic. And you have large numbers of people. So at that time there were 135 million people. And until then, until they were ruled by the Mughal Empire and various Nawabs and Rajas and whatnot. And whereas the British were familiar with parliamentary democracy. So they're like, who do we talk to? Right? We are used to working with uh, educated group of people who will deliberate and then pass laws. Who do we talk to? So what they did is that uh, they came up with uh, a response. And the response was through a series of acts which were passed by the British government. And secondly, because they had to keep a very large population in check and not have them unite and throw them out of the country, right? Which is what the greatest fear was. They followed a policy of divide et empera, which is divide and rule. And primarily they focused on the Hindu Muslim divide and also on divisions within uh, the uh, Hindus and Muslims, which were based on language or other things. They also looked for extremists versus moderates. Extremists are the people who wanted the British to get out of India. Moderate said, okay, let's work with you and, and let's work towards uh, what they call a dominion status, which is that you'll still rule us, but we'll rule ourselves for the most part, right? So that's that's how Canada was ruled for a long time. And India was very unique in that the British controlled many parts of the country in the form of uh, provinces or presidencies. And then there were also states, right? The princely states. And those princely states were uh, independent uh, by themselves with some control by the British. So like Mysore, Kish Kashmir, Hyderabad, they were all independent states. So they started ruling this country, but as Indians got educated and they became more and more aware, uh, they had to slowly give away concessions to assuage the nationalist sentiments because Indians said, who are you to rule us, right? So, and then many people got a modern education and modern uh, uh, philosophy came into India. So then they said, why are you guys ruling us? And uh, so they had to assuage the Indian nationalist sentiments. And so they passed a series of acts. Uh, so I, I have uh, those at the bottom. So the, the government of India Act 1858 was the start of it all, uh, where Queen Victoria declared the empress was declared the empress of India. So the uh, direct rule of India by the British monarchy and liquidates the East India Company and transfers the authority to the British Crown. And the British Crown in India was represented by one person who was the Viceroy of India, right? So the Viceroy of India was the most important person in India to whom all authority was delegated. And then that was followed by the Government of India Act 1861, where they established paternal despotic rule. It said that the Viceroy is going to rule the India, he's going to have a mini cabinet of people to help him. There's going to be voting members, non-voting members, representatives from various parts of India, various parts of Indian society. And uh, then they'll decide what to do. So it was a, not truly representative. It was more like, we know what's best for you. So we'll, and we'll take the decisions for you. So that's the basic idea. Then uh, what happened is that uh, as Indians got uh, educated, traveled outside the world and got more exposure, there was an agitation that said, hey, we need more autonomy. Who are you to rule us? So then there was the Morley Minto reform. So Morley was a famous liberal philosopher who became, uh, who, who got elected uh, to high office in Britain. He was a pretty uh, powerful guy. So he partnered with Lord Minto, who was the Viceroy of India to conduct some of these reforms. And essentially what they did is that they brought in liberal constitutional government. And they spent uh, that, because they didn't want to uh, give control, uh, limited elections for a central legislative council and then state councils in the areas where they rule. And because they were thinking about the Hindu Muslim divide, uh, they had separate electorates for Muslims, right? So I think they very clearly were taking advantage of that. And then uh, that uh, was superseded by the Government of India Act in 1919, where they introduced what's called Diarchy Rule. And Diarchy Rule means that um, they give a lot more freedom to Indians. Uh, they said, okay, you can have uh, 
provincial councils uh, which have some limited authority they know they'll run the schools they'll take care of the roads the sewers and that kind of thing maintenance of cities but everything else including finance defense is all uh, is uh, is all said by us right so and so the final authority though remained with the governors who were british and and then the viceroy and his viceroy's council who were all british pretty much and then what they did is they said oh this division thing is working so let's uh, include six and others so uh, all that uh, ended with uh, in 1928 with the simon commission so as part of this uh, they said in let's revisit this in 10 years time uh, so they brought in the simon commission and this was a review uh, skit, uh, which was headed by sir john simon whose picture you see here and there were seven members who were uh, representing different parties in britain so there was a liberal there were con conservatives there were labor party they were all there and they came to india and uh, to study the constitutional reforms and how well things were going and then they uh, made recommendations and uh, indians didn't like it uh, they many of us have grown up with this simon go back simon wapas jao uh, protests all over india because not a single indian was sitting on this commission and uh, because they recommended separate electorates for hindus and muslims and other minorities um, again following the principle of uh, divide and rule right and then uh, fam most famously in those protests lala lajpat rai dies of injuries he suffered uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, can i go back for a minute um, is that one of the members was clement atley who was a labor mp and he was he basically came and he started getting committed to indian freedom and clement atley plays a huge role in the independence of india as you can as you will see in a little bit uh, next slide okay so what happened is that uh, people protested against the simon commission and the british basically said okay you guys think you know better Uh, tell, you come up with the constitution so uh, what happened is that number of people uh, got together the congress party that included nehru ambedkar subhash chandra bose uh, lala lajpat rai all these people uh, came up and they drafted the nehru report in fact you can find the pdf of the nehru report there and uh, it was written in response and the nehru report outlined or sketched out how india should be governed and in fact if you read it it's basically a, exactly what india is right now so we have a federal nation with universal franchise bill of rights for indian citizens all the authorities derived from the people every eligible citizen uh, over a certain age is uh, uh, allowed to vote and uh, there's some deviations um, government in indian languages is what they thought uh, with some english but now government is in english with some indian languages is, is reversed language based states which we all familiar with no state religion all are equal secularism is a key cornerstone and then they said we don't want separate electorates no separate electorates for muslims or sikhs or anybody else there's a limited special treatment of minorities you stand up for election and with universal franchise and you exercise power so no special treatment basically uh, next slide So then, uh, along with that, um, in 1930 was an important year because they had the Salt Satyagraha um, later on in that year. But the year started off with the Purna Swaraj Declaration, which is the Indian Declaration of Freedom, which was written by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, who was one of one of the key authors of the Nehru Report, and he moved a resolution in Lahore on January 26, 1930. calling for complete freedom or purna swaraj and all members of the indian national congress had to take a pledge and that pledge said that we will work for purna swaraj or complete independence and on the new year's day of uh, that year of the of december 1929 or uh, 1930 at midnight again that's important uh, thing he nehru pandit nehru uh, hoisted the flag on the banks of the river ravi uh which is the first flag of independent india that was um uh, designed by pingali venkaiah and it had the uh, gandhi ji's charka and it had the tricolor on it so it's so you can see it's pretty close to what the final indian flag is right so this is a very important date in the history of india uh next slide so the british in response said okay what do we do we've got uh, simon commission report we've got nehru report purna swaraj declaration what do we do and then uh, the muslims uh, came back with a response that's a 14 point response that was written by jinnah we'll come to in a little bit so then they said okay let's call everybody to london and then let's have these conferences so they held a series of conferences uh, where they had all the important people there so gandhi ji represented the congress uh, they had all the british political parties were there the princes who ruled various 
states within India were there. The Muslims were there. Uh, so they had all stakeholders there, and they discussed the future of a, a Indian state. They discussed the Simon Commission, Nehru Report, everything that the Muslims had come up with. These talks were essentially a failure uh, because the Labour Party, led by Clement Attlee, was in favour of early resolution. They wanted to give India dominion status and then finally move India towards independence. Remember that Clement Attlee said India should be free. And they were thwarted by the conservatives. The conservatives were aligned with the Muslim League, actually, and the princely states. Uh, they liked the princely states and the Muslim League. And they said, no, 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 uh, we can't uh, allow that. Uh, so the Muslim League said, we will have, we want a separate electorates. We'll come to what they wanted. Um, and they had an alliance with the conservatives. So the talks essentially failed. So India did not get dominion status or independence, a roadmap to independence. So they did not get what they wanted. But what happened is that there was a new uh, system of governance that came out. So the British listened to everybody and they've drafted a new act, which we'll come to uh, in a little bit, which is the Government of India Act 1930, which said, okay, let's give them more power, right? We'll still control the place, but we'll give them more power. Uh, let's throw them some more. So there was a new system of elections, and uh, but they did not uh, let go of separate electorates of Muslims. Uh, next slide. All right, so at that point, the Muslim League, which represented the old Muslim nobility, all the Nawabs and Nizams and, and so on, um, who were uh, basically realized that they were on a very weak ground because demographically, uh, they were, um, the Muslims were only 24% 20, 20, of the population of undivided India. Some areas were majority Muslim, some areas were uh, uh, had minority Muslim. And so they did not want to give up. So the state of Hyderabad, which was ruled by the Nizam, for instance, was mostly Hindu, right? So he didn't want to give up power. So what happened is that on their behalf um, and prodded by Alama Iqbal, uh, who was the poet and Muslim national, he was also an Indian nationalist. He, he was also a freedom fighter along with Jinnah. Uh, they wrote a rebuttal and Muhammad Ali Jinnah wrote a 14 point rebuttal to the Nehru report. And in his demand, he said, I want separate electorates for Muslims and I want an equal share in the federal power. So Hindus who constituted 74%, 70% uh, Hindus and others would get one share, half the share, and then Muslims would get half the share, something like that. And they did not want, uh, and uh, so which was uh, bitterly opposed by the, uh, by the Indian National Congress who wanted a free country with universal franchise and elections. Right? So there was a fundamental differences of opinion. And finally, what happened is that a young guy, a young Muslim guy called Chaudhary Rahmat Ali in 1933 uh, wrote the Pakistan Declaration. And he said, we want, I think if it doesn't work out, we want a separate country called Pakistan. That includes the areas which are majority Muslim. So Punjab, Northwest, Frontier Province, Kashmir, Sindh, and Baluchistan. So they wanted, let's form a separate country. And then, of course, on the other side, Bengal, half of Bengal. And so uh, the Pakistan declaration was on 28 January 1933. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, because the mass phase of the Indian freedom had struggle had started and it was uh, apparent that it was going to end in a universe, in a democratic republic with universal franchise, uh, that was not acceptable. Right. And then finally, things got to the point where in 1940, the die was cast. Jinnah moves the Pakistan Declaration Resolution in Lahore at a Muslim League meeting. And that's a picture of him moving that. And uh, at that point, the division of India was on the cards. Uh, next slide. So, uh, so, so then the Government of India Act uh, came into being 1935, where uh, based on all these discussions, um, uh, the person on the bottom left, uh, Sir Samuel Hoare, who was the Secretary of India, uh, he authored a new act. And the new act ends the diarchy rule. And he says, okay, now each uh, province or each state will have a legislative assembly and a council of state, and um, they will rule the state completely. They will have full freedom with some uh, sub topics being controlled by the center and then some topics being concurrent, that is by control by both. And he, uh, they started the new states, uh, Orissa was separated from Bengal, Sindh from Bombay. And then there was a provision for a future federal Indian state with provinces and princely states. So this was closer to what uh, uh, India finally became and closer to a liberal democratic republic. And it established a power structure for the future Indian state and it established representative democracy, closer to what Britain had. Uh, 
but this whole thing was opposed by the indian national congress because it had no indian involvement this guy and maybe another person just wrote the whole thing by themselves all the debates were in the british parliament with zero indian involvement and the other thing is retained separate electorates which the indian national congress uh, did not support um and it did not come with a promise for dominion status or independence which is what they were looking for uh, but however what happened is that the indian national congress participated in, in elections so they had elections in 1937 they they participated and the indian national congress actually won all those elections and uh, for instance uh, see rajagopalachari became the chief minister of the madras province and so this is a picture of him taking the oath in the madras legislative assembly right so you can see that there all right next slide so then uh, what happened is the quit india movement happened gandhi ji nehru uh, and all the indian national congress leaders were thrown into jail muslim league cooperated and uh, so they were not thrown into jail so they got an advantage and they lost uh, two years right there and two or three years which gave the muslim league time to uh, consolidate and shore up their support and in 1944 when gandhi ji was finally released he said the greatest danger is uh, a partition of india or division of india so he met with jinnah and started a dialogue with jinnah saying let's try to keep india united let's try to bridge our differences and uh, those fundamental differences were not resolved by the time jinnah could see that he had the upper hand basically and then the following year uh, the second world war ended clement atli got elected as prime minister and he had already committed to indian independence so he started immediately moving things towards independence and the clock started ticking then and for uh, a long story short march 1947 lord mountbatten was appointed as the viceroy viceroy of india he arrives in india and he is the guy who sets the date he says he says we need to get out of here before the the differences between the inc and the muslim league erupt into civil war and we get caught in between and he basically set a very short time table and he said august 14th and 15th we are out of here right so we are going to british rule will end on august 14th 15th so he set the date and uh, he essentially got nehru and jinnah together and the congress leaders and made them agree to the partition of india and the partition of india was ultimately they had to give in um, and except gandhi uh, who did not accept it and then uh, what he did is that he recruited a uh, civil servant sir cyril radcliffe who arrived in india in july 1947 one month before and he was appointed to draw the boundary between india and pakistan which is called the radcliffe line by august so radcliffe had never been to india he had never seen any a map of india so he came in he basically based on just statistic number he drew the boundary between india and pakistan right and then he published that in august and then finally the day of independence came august 14th 1947 is pakistan independence day where jinnah uh, is you can see him addressing the nation august 15 1947 is india independence day where nehru made his famous speech at uh, at lal qila red fort and then what happened is it was overshadowed by a massive tragedy which is a tragedy of partition where tens of millions of people were displaced a uh, million people were killed in the violence gandhi ji did not take part in the festivities he was in calcutta up trying to bring peace to bengal and uh, with hussein surawadi and mujibur rahman trying to bring okay next slide right here are some cartoons before i hand off to sanjay uh, so this is a cartoon from the british uh, um, uh, daily mail which is a conservative weekly the british thought that after me it's all going to go to hell right so they had the, these cartoons reflect their view so british clear out free india from training and then you see all this violence of partition and then there's the troops boarding the ship and then uh, goodbye <laughs> good luck you'll need it <laughs> kind of thing All right. So with that, I'll stop now, and Sanjay will continue, and he'll talk about the Indian Republic and uh, Indian Constitution. All right. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Rupesh. Uh, uh, I'd request everyone to please go on mute uh, because we're hearing some noises in the background. Uh, so, so this is the timeline. So now, as Rupesh explained, you know the the process, the road to independence was not an easy one, as you know. It took uh, several decades to maneuver. Uh, maneuver to all of the all the different challenges uh, figure out the leadership and to deal with all the other challenges thrown in their way by the british by deliberately trying to divide and rule the indian population as it is the indian population the religious lines were one one division uh, you know existing division within 
the country's population. And then there were the language divisions and there were many, many challenges. So as you can see from this timeline, it took a while. Uh, the Constituent Assembly, which I'll talk about in the uh, following slides, I'll go a little bit into detail, uh, which was you know, given the task of uh, drawing, framing the constitution, uh, had many, many challenges, uh, as I explained. And this was the, once they were formed on December 9, 1946, which was when they first met, they went through all these different stages, as you can see, uh, you know, the adoption of the national flag, the actual Independence Day, which again, uh, as Rupesh explained, the Declaration of Independence of the Purna Swaraj was signed on January 26, 1930. And they, that date was actually the unofficial Independence Day for India. Uh, but because British just up and left, August 15th became the Independence Day. So then that January 26th date, uh, in order to maintain the sanctity of the date and to uh, mark the date in Indian history forever, that was chosen as the date when the, when the Indian constitution would go into effect eventually. And that would become the Republic Day as we know uh, today. So along the way, as you can see, there were several uh, other challenges also. Partition was a huge, huge uh, deal. There were so many people who died uh, during the partition. Uh, there was one war that happened in 1949 with Pakistan. Uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, and that also put some roadblocks, but they kept ch churning through all of that. And eventually, as you can see in this timeline, on January 26, 1950, the Indian constitution went into effect. So let's go and examine how all of this came into being. Next slide. So what's the Indian Constituent Assembly? So it is a, basically an assembly of people who are formed for the purpose of writing the constitution for independent India. Uh, in 1934, uh, M.N. Roy, uh, Manavendra Roy, he was actually an Indian revolutionary. He was a, considered as a radical activist and a political theorist. So he basically proposed the idea of a constituent assembly. He said, we need Indians to come up with their own constitution. And uh, uh, he actually mentioned this in one of his speeches. And as a matter of fact, he even drafted a constitution of free India much later in 1944. So his idea is grain of an idea kind of, you know, uh, uh, as you know, the Nehru report was also a constitution of sorts. So that kind of developed into this demand, which was taken by the Congress party in 1935, saying we want uh, to be, you know, we want a constitution assembly, one constituent assembly put in place, uh, which will be constituted of Indians who will put together the constitution. So uh, British finally accepted the demand in 1940, but it took several years for them. And in the cabinet mission plan of 1946, uh, they said elections, were, the actual elections were held to select the members uh, for the formation of the, the constituent assembly. But they were elected indirectly. They were not, they, this was not a, a typical election that we normally hear of where everybody votes. This was members of the provincial assemblies, uh, nominated members uh, to be part of the uh, assembly. And they met in New Delhi for the first time in, on December 9, 1946 at the parliament hall. Next slide. So if you look at, the, the day 1946 and eventually you look at the actual date of adoption they took it was a monumental task and it took them three years to put it all together you know they held uh, in all they held 11 sessions uh, which was a total of 166 days but as you can imagine uh, these sessions are when they come together decide what needs to be done and then they go off and put it all together right so so uh, it, it was it was pretty huge and especially they had to deal with wars and other situations you know partition and other things that were going on in the meantime uh, the original membership was 389 uh, but during the partition uh, you know uh, uh, as proposed by mountbatten uh, plan in 1947 uh, several you know separate constitution uh, constituent assembly was set up for pakistan and representative of some of the provinces also left the, the the assembly. So in the end, they had 299 members, uh, which included 15 women. Uh, and they came from 12 Indian provinces and uh, 70 of them came from 29 princely states. Uh, and they set up a drafting committee whose responsibility was to actually draft the constitution under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Uh, and then what they worked on and put together was finally uh, you know, uh, signed on 24 January 1950, and it went into force on, on that date. Uh, you can actually read the full assembly report. I've uh, put a website over there. 
uh, and you can actually read the report and the different meetings and all the details of how much work went into this uh, at that website. Next slide, please. So here's a, a picture of uh, uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru moving the objectives resolution for the Constituent Assembly. And it was unanim unanimously accept, uh, accepted by the Assembly on 22nd January in 1947. Uh, next slide. This is the objectives resolution. I just put it in here. So if these slides end up getting shared with you all, you can read uh, what went into the original objectives resolution. And as you can see here, uh, you know, uh, uh, the second one where they now say the territories that at that point was British India will now form the Indian states and, and will be completely free of outside of, and they won't be known as British India going uh, forward. And, uh, uh, and they kind of explain that all the power and authority will be derived from the people. So you, if you get a chance, you should definitely read this and you'll find a copy of this on the website that I pointed out earlier. Next slide, please. So these were the prominent members of the Constituent Assembly. As I said, there were 299 members. And if you go through the list, they are who's, who's who of the Indian independence movement. These are people who dedicated their lives to fight for independence. And if you go through the list, you will see a lot of familiar names. But here are a few of them that uh, were, were part of the main committee. As you can see, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, who eventually ended up being the president of Independent India, uh, was the president of the, the committee itself. Uh, H.C. Mukherjee, he was a prominent Christian leader from Bengal. Uh, and he was a chairman on, he was actually a chairman on the minorities committee also uh, at that point. And to kind of give enough representation to different religious groups. He was also one of the members and he was vice president of this uh, committee. Uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, as you all know, uh, became the first prime minister of India. Uh, as you saw, he had also uh, published the Nehru report and he had a lot of knowledge about uh, administration, about running a country. And so he was obviously part of the Union Constitutional Committee. Uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who we will actually talk about a little bit later in the second uh, session of, uh, of this uh, two session uh, seminar. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit because he was a key person instrumental in drafting the, uh, the constitution. Uh, his personal experiences played a huge role in uh, providing adequate representation to different groups of people around India. Uh, Justice B. N. Rao, he was actually uh, uh, one of the foremost of Indian's jurists, and uh, he researched all the con several constitutions around the globe, uh, globe, and kind of came up with the uh, you know the uh, bits and pieces that went into the Indian Constitution to provide uh, 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 you know a rock solid constitutional framework. Uh, and he was actually uh, uh, pretty well uh, educated, and he. Uh, as you will see, was very well respected around the world. Uh, we are also going to do a, a profile on him uh, in the second session. Sardar Patel was our first deputy prime minister, uh, and he actually played a huge role in building United India by integrating the princely states uh, uh, as later on as they started putting, uh, you know, after independence. And then uh, uh, Ganesh uh, Vasudev Mavlankar was our speaker. Uh, he also eventually ended up being the first speaker of uh, Lok Sabha. Uh, and in TTK Krishnapachari uh, was the second vice president of the committee, and he was the first Indian finance minister. Uh, he was actually one of the founding members of the National Council of Applied Economic Research. Next slide, please. And th these were the seven members of the drafting committee. Uh, B. R. Ambedkar, as I just mentioned, was the chairman. Uh, K. N. Munshi, he was a freedom fighter. Uh, his name, uh, he was a freedom fighter activist and a writer. Uh, his, he actually wrote under the pen name Gansham Vyas, uh, and he founded the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, uh, which is a non-profit uh, and educational uh, institution. Uh, Mohammed uh, Sadula, he was the prime minister of Assam in British India, uh, and he was the only member of the Northeast India to be elected to the drafting committee. So they tried to give representation to various uh, provinces, various regions, uh, and different religions, as you can see uh, from the representation. Uh, and he was one of the ones who represented the Northeast part of India. Uh, Aladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, uh, he was actually the advocate general of Madras state. So many of these people who were part of the drafting committee, uh, 
uh, were actually uh, lawyers or advocates. So they they understood the legal process, uh, you know, very well, uh, or they were part of civil service. So they, you know, uh, understood the nitty gritties of, of uh, uh, you know, first of all, the legalities, the language that needs to go into the constitution and also the uh, various aspects of administration that need to be covered uh, when you draft a constitution. So G.S. Iyengar uh, was a, uh, a member of the Madras Civil Service, uh, and he was uh, later on the Prime Minister of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, and N. Madhav Rao, he was also uh, an uh, civil service member who served as a Diwan of Mysore. And we already talked about uh, T.T. Krishnamachari. So next slide, please. So here's where uh, the members actually took the pledge during the midnight session of the Constituent Assembly on uh, 14th and 15th August, 1947. Uh, and finally, uh, on uh, 24, 25th November 1949, uh, Dr. Babasaheb Ambedkar presented the final draft of the Indian Constitution to Rajinder Prasad, who was the president of the Constituent Assembly. And as you can see uh, from their faces, they're delighted that that monumental task was finally completed. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, you'll see that Dr. Rajendra Prasad signed the constitution into effect. So they waited till January 24th, because obviously, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, January 26th was the date in mind uh, for them to finally put this constitution into effect. Uh, next slide, please. So here are a couple of uh, cartoons. <laughs> uh, one of them is, you know, uh, as you can see, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar sitting on a snail. And uh, so, you know, uh, even today, a lot of people um, talk about, you know, uh, the news and the journalism and how it is represented and the coverage that they give. So I, I think this is kind of a jest for how long it took to put together the constitution. And you will see that like any uh, public service uh, action, uh, public service that takes place, there is criticism uh, because, you know, there is not, it's, really difficult to kind of uh, unify the thoughts and uh, ideas of, you know, uh, 135 million, as Rupesh said, uh, or maybe more at the time of independence, uh, let alone, you know, we, we know how difficult it is even to get 10 people in a room to agree. So it was a monumental task, but, you know, uh, out, for an outsider looking in, they made fun of some of these things. And the other one represents how, you know, once the constitution went into effect and you, uh, when you, see so, uh, later on in the second session, uh, what went into the constitution, some of them felt that, you know, there was too much, uh, while, it, while it was being uh, put, molded into shape, uh, people felt that, you know, there was a lot of influence of socialism or things like that. So kind of takeaways from these, uh, from these cartoons. Uh, next one, please. And this is one more where they are, you know, the, the constitution of India, the baby is just born and the people, are you know <laughs> looking at it as you can see the first person standing uh, near the top of the uh, bed there watching anxiously kind of not knowing how to react and the congress party is the nurse uh, you know they are the ones who delivered the baby kind of so to speak uh, and uh, and the leaders are standing around you know uh, uh, coddling the baby the, the baby which is the constitution so uh, anyways uh, as i mentioned you know i mean uh, when you do something in a uh, in a democracy there will be different ideas and people will all obviously uh, have a different, different people will have different way of looking at things, right? So obviously the Constituent Assembly was had uh, many critics and here are some of the top criticisms of that. One of the ones, main ones, as, we, as I mentioned, that they said they were not directly elected uh, by an adult, uh, you know, franchise. Uh, but if you look at the other side of the equation, most of the leaders who represented the Constituent Assembly, as if you go through the entire list, were very popular among the people. They were the ones who actually uh, participated, you know, big time uh, in in the independence struggle. And the other thing was, as the uh, immediately after the assembly, uh, just before the assembly, there was so much uh, the divide and rule uh, by the British had taken such a had uh, cut such a deep wound. Uh, in the Indian psyche, and as you saw, uh, the the Muslim 
portion of the constituent assembly also up and left. So there was so much going on. Country was on the brink of partition and uh, there was so many communal uh, rights, riots going on. So it would have been impractical to actually hold an uh, election. So that uh, criticism was kind of unfounded. And then you look at, you know, it took a long time. Again, that was a big criticism as you saw from that snail cartoon. Uh, but then, you know, one thing you have to remember is India was a very diverse country divided by religious and linguistic uh, differences. And so it was, it was a tough uh, job, no matter what. I mean, you know, uh, even if there was no partition, even if there was no war, to make sure everybody was properly represented, all the different castes, the different uh, languages, uh, you know, people from the far corners of India were properly represented. It was a tough job to begin with. So, you know, uh, we need to take that into account. Uh, they also complained that the Constituent Assembly was not a sovereign body. It was created by the British. But as you see, it was a fully independent body which put together constitu uh, constitution and it was all Indian. So, you know, I mean, so that again was an unfounded criticism. Uh, language was criticized for being literary and complicated, but I think uh, that is something when you put so many lawyers in a room, <laughs> you're bound to have complicated language. Uh, that's a little lawyer humor there, but uh, jokes apart, it, it, you know, these things do take a lot of uh, work and to come up with the proper language and take into account all the different nuances, it is, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, and uh, they said that it was dominated by the Congress party. Uh, but again, Congress party was one of the biggest parties uh, when people rallied around uh, Nehruji and Gandhiji and they kind of, they were the largest representative party of the country at that time. Uh, and, and they did have people from all different provinces. Uh, and the last point again, speaks to the same thing where they said uh, it had a, a dominant Hindu dominance. But then again, it was a pro pro proportional representation, right? I mean, the uh, as Rupesh just said, the uh, Hindu part of the population was, uh, you know, a, a substantial chunk of the of the Indian population at that point. Uh, next slide. So, uh, in the next session, uh, Swati will also go a little bit more into detail about the Indian, uh, Indian Constitution, as well as Rupesh will also talk about some of the. Uh, things that went into the wrangling that happened and all of the little little stories around what happened during the actual uh, when the actual constitu uh, constitution was being framed but here are some nice uh, uh, little tidbits about the constitution uh, that you'll find fascinating uh, one of the things is the original copy was not typeset or printed it was handwritten and calligraphed in both english and hindi so uh, prem bihari narayan rezada was the actual calligrapher who did that and many of the pages have illustrations by the artists of Shantini Ketan. So if you go into, uh, if you see the original copy, you will find graphical representations of the uh, type that I've shown there in that slide. Uh, and it was all done by the artists of Shantini Ketan. Uh, it was the, like I said earlier, B. N. Rao went to different parts of the world. He studied various constitution, met with a lot of legal and constitutional experts, and they put together the constitution. So here are some of the concepts that were taken from other constitution and imbued into the Indian constitution. So the concept of liberty, equality, and fraternity came from the French constitution. Uh, the five-year plan was taken from the USSR. Uh, Supreme Court was kind of based on uh, Supreme Court functions, which was taken from the Japanese constitution. And the directive principles were taken from the Irish constitution. So they borrowed I wouldn't say uh, they kind of went and chose some of those things that really made sense in other constitutions and were missing in, you know, elsewhere. So, for example, the French constitution didn't have a five year plan and five year plans turned out to be, uh, uh, you know, a big, big, uh, had a big impact on India's development as a nation because they kind of put together these objectives uh, and, 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 you know, delivered on it. Uh, then if you go to the Indian uh, parliament in the library of parliament of India, you can actually see the original copies of the constitution of India, uh, which are kept in a special helium filled case because helium is an inert gas. So to avoid reaction and to maintain the integrity of the, of the paper on which it was written. Uh, next slide. Uh, it is the longest written constitution of any independent country in the world. And that's not surprising. It took them three years to put together. There was language in there which covered everyone. Uh, you know, as I explained, the challenges that went into it. So it's not surprising that it is one of the largest constitution, longest constitution of any independent country. 
uh, and it is supposed to be one of the world's best constitution because they thought of so many things uh, that you know uh, even till today as india deals with a massive population and uh, there are very few amendments that actually uh, went into the constitutions it has only seen 94 amendments as compared to other constitutions around the world so next slide please Oh, so that is the last. Looks like that's the last slide for today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so I, I think uh, in the next session now we will be talking about uh, uh, the some of the main role players in uh, who who were instrumental in putting this constitution together, uh, as well as go a little bit into detail about uh, what what were the discussions, the wrangling behind the scenes that happened that in the end you know gave us the constitution as we know of. Uh, today, so uh, I think we can open it for uh, for questions. Uh, if there are any, uh, you can raise hand and uh, and then unmute and ask the question at this point. So yeah, looks like we. Currently, don't have any questions. Uh, uh, hopefully, there is a lot of audience on the live stream. I don't know if there is some way for someone to look at the live stream and uh, see some of the comments or questions over there and relate to us. So we had planned a one and a half hour session for uh, for this, just so that we can make sure that we cover the content as well as provide enough time for some dialogue and discussion. So. Um, looks like everyone's been so thoroughly uh, coached by you that uh, it's pretty understandable. I think it was uh, wonderful. I, I very informative. So many of this uh, these questions were answered that we had no idea about. You know, so it's very very nice. Thank you, Sanjay. I think you know um, we can uh, wait a couple of minutes if there's anybody who has any questions. Otherwise, we can reconvene in tomorrow at six six p.m. Mm -hmm. um, is there something uh, you're on mute, Sushi? Yes, please yes. go ahead. Yes, uh, for all the panelists here, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, could you just give us a little overview of what your second session will be? I know you did mention it during your uh, session, so maybe there could be some questions related to that. Uh, you said you'll speak a little bit about, you know, Ambe, uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, for example. So, who are the various personalities that you are planning to detail on? Uh, for tomorrow, and maybe there'll be some questions uh, around that. Things have changed, even in the way we learned history as a kid, and the way there was a lot of, you know, the, the principles of Gandhi and Nehru, and we have learned some more truth about certain leaders that we probably did not know from the history books. So is it something that you could elaborate tomorrow on, or if you have something that you would like to say today, which is, you know, totally different from what the history books teach us in India? Uh, so a lot of it is, uh, you know, derived from research and, uh, 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 you know, we are all uh, students of history and we kind of uh, derive from uh, research. And like you said, um, history is typically, we always talk about it, history is, you know, the perspective of the person who narrates or writes it. So uh, we, we picked up a lot of uh, information about, uh, you know, some of the prominent leaders who are part of this process. And so we are going to be talking about uh, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, Vallabhai Patel, uh, Rajendra Prasad, as well as uh, B. N. Rao, uh, who was a diplomat, like I explained, who put together, uh, who was, who played a huge role in putting all of this together, uh, his knowledge and expertise on legal matters and constitutional matters actually helped put all of this together and his research helped uh, frame this. But if there are any other leaders that you would like for us to talk about, uh, you can put it in uh, today's, uh, in, uh, I mean, obviously with, with a limit because we do have to uh, deliver on our uh, session otherwise where we will be talking about the details of the the constitution uh, but we'll be happy to you know research and put together slides on maybe another leader or two yeah we can put those questions in on our facebook uh, you know under the youtube on um, a facebook video you know you can add those questions and we'll take a look at it and uh, maybe you can answer the questions um so, yeah as a, you yeah. know being privileged and being right here i'll say that subhash chandra bose could be one person i could say you could add your yeah. list. maybe not for tomorrow but if you could at least give some you know 
there's right, a, right. So, so in the independence day uh, uh, sessions that we did with along with IIGB in that partnership we actually went into detail on some of these prominent leaders so uh, we do have uh, you know uh, so we can actually pull it in uh, tomorrow yes, he was great idea a, because a, adults a, did not hear that so yeah. you know i think that will be a very useful piece of information yeah. so he was uh, he was very instrumental in the freedom struggle but uh, in the uh, delivering or writing or, or participating in the constitutional framework delivery uh, you know his role was limited so that is the reason why you don't see his name prominently uh, there in those participants but it did have an influence on the constitution oh absolutely and so that's, that's i think dr baba saheb ambedkar actually took a lot of that into into account as you saw there was a presentation from the northeast uh, part of india where he's from and uh, dr ambedkar took a lot of those things into account when he was putting all of that together yeah so uh, i want to say this that uh, uh, subhash chandra bose as a was the youngest member of the nehru committee right so nehru report a uh, good chunk of it was influenced by his ideas and his views in 1929 but what happened is that in 1937 or thereafter shortly thereafter he ceased to play a role in indian politics because he left india he was imprisoned and then he left india and went to germany and japan and then uh, to singapore so he was not in the country at all so uh, he was not there when the real action was happening um, so that's one of the things reasons why we don't talk about him yeah they he formed the indian national army as you know when they actually attacked the british india uh, so yeah it is uh, you know uh, his his approach was a, a slightly different a militant approach just to kind of show british that you know indians were not afraid of them and were willing to take uh, you know more decisive action in his uh, you know uh, ideology under his ideology and so yeah so that's the re- reason like i said he was not actively uh, a, a member of the the constituent assembly Yeah, but that's why I was saying to add a different perspective is is good because otherwise it's almost just like you know you're either talking about you know it's like one party, Congress party, and mostly everything around that. So it's a little bit more giving a little bit more diverse about you know what are the who are the other people who also influenced even though they were not directly included, mm-hmm. they they did influence a lot of the reason the, our constitution is what it is. I think yeah, yeah. so we will come up, uh, Rupesh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think we we looked around actually for the same reason that you uh, outlined that we looked around at who else was there, and then the one person who did stand out, and uh, you know we we actually have a book on the Constituent Assembly that all three of us have read, um, or, uh, which uh, basically highlights the role of B N Rao. Uh, we'll talk about him. Um, uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, the Muslim League, which was the main opponent of the Indian National Congress, took themselves out of the picture, right? <laughs> so uh, with partition, and then uh, the Hindu Mas- Mahasabha, which were the forerunners of the BJP and uh, so on, uh, they were very small at that time. Though they had people who were sympathized with them in the Congress, uh, but they were very small and not uh, truly. Uh, Uh, you know did not have that kind of influence so there was it primarily it looks like the congress party which was actually very diverse uh, had a lot to do with it there's a small group of people who actually drove the whole thing uh, it looks like it that it looks looks like that uh, but then being said uh, there were various groups there within the constituent assembly who were doing things there's a group of women there's a group of uh, princely state representatives there are people who were representing various language language regions uh, you know uh, marathi bengali uh, kannada so those guys those there were people from who had specific agendas and specific views who were part of it but they were mostly overruled or superseded by uh, the the people at the top uh, one thing i would like is to stress the the role of women you know uh, who are the 15 who are the prominent 15 women i, I suppose vijay lakshmi pandit Mm-hmm. Uh, some of these Sarojini Naidu Sarojini Naidu Sarojini Naidu was actually the so really it would be great the if you could uh, yeah if you could highlight their contribution and because you know that was like you said 15 amongst that many that was a pretty important role to have played uh, so i think that would be a great subject tomorrow to add to that you know about their roles mm-hmm. yeah so, i just and, make sure that all the uh, women who were uh, part of the the committee are you know we'll display their names and their pictures so one of the challenges that we had was there is so much here that again you know we had to kind of, uh, of arrive at a balance where we thought you know if we have younger members in the audience as well as parents uh, we were trying to appeal or, or provide content that would make uh, sense to you know our, our absolutely but don't leave out the women <laughs> yeah. yeah plus 
we want yeah. some representation of uh, highlighting some of the women because they were a very sh- sh- small minority with all the men there so obviously yeah. they must have had a lot to contribute in order to have been included so uh, and what what further role they played after you know in post uh, republic uh, india you know what did they uh, serve as and how was their role highlighted afterwards that would be yeah. good. No. plus la you know we are actually going into details about okay, the perfect. constitution itself what makes the indian constitution so unique yeah. and then we are also bringing in highlights of differences between the indian constitution and other constitutions oh absolutely like, no i so. i appreciate that part of it but i would like i was just saying if you can just talk a little bit more about the women that would be perfect but i think sure. you guys are doing a fabulous job so no complaints i think as a woman we want to just I know we to get that in there but fantastic job great guys any other questions anybody has so uh, yeah one other thing definitely what lata is talking about from the women perspective right we want to also emphasize that how much india was ahead of even the western countries like how much does the us have any women influence in their constitution literally not much at all and in fact until kamala harris is becoming the vice president we have not even had a woman in that position ever in this country so how india from the very beginning had you know women involvement it's good to emphasize that uh, in general from a you know uh, progressive I know, india exactly i agree with the sushil with the neighboring countries too which were sri lanka and pakistan and bangladesh all of them have had female leaders you know as as uh, ruling the countries but more advanced nations it took them a lot more at <laughs> longer to have someone uh you know in place so i think that differentiate some of our um so i think i uh, i know that will be something that would be avya you do you have a question i guess yes she's go ahead as much as possible can't hear you can you raise the volume on your uh this is the mic that i can have please uh, i'm not sure yeah cannot hear her we cannot hear you hun it's very unclear oh no you're muted now unmute uh sorry i was in mute but uh, uh, yeah looks like she uh they uh, they've gone to the chat window i was just going to suggest going yeah. to the chat window and typing please, out the question type your um hmm. or comments if anybody has to offer comments to they are most welcome <laughs> just absorbing the content wonderful thank you truly appreciate the fact that you, you know you're absorbing this uh, content by these wonderful teachers the slides are easy to understand and uh, you know visually appealing thank you we have rupesh to thank for that <laughs> rupesh has a very, very good uh, approach to will the teach. slides be shared uh, the slides will not but it is live streamed so you can view it at our igb youtube or facebook account you can certainly uh, uh, look at this whole session again on your own time and take down notes or whatever you feel comfortable that's okay because it will be available for viewing and um, yeah it was a team work by swati uh, rupesh and uh, sanjay and uh, with their um, wonderful uh, you know uh, tag teaming they've done a great job and i just want to say end today right uh, today's session so we can then uh, come back tomorrow and reconvene as i said and um, again thank you to all who have attended today's session and thank you to the presenters thank you sushil for managing the youtube and the facebook streaming um thank you to all the attendees here some of our directors are here thank you so much and um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow good night tata ji thank you good night bye thank you everybody thank you bye bye live stream band kar diya na कर दो